Today on Moment of Zen, we're airing an interview with David Sachs, who likely needs no introduction as a host of All In, former CEO and venture investor. This candid conversation focuses on his intellectual and political history from his days fighting student activism at Stanford. We also cover Silicon Valley's views towards politics in the last 30 years and the core societal tensions between the elite and the non-college educated. It was first published on Upstream in 2023. David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, good to be here. Awesome. Let's uh, let's start with PayPal. Uh, I feel okay. like what's happened at PayPal has been a metaphor for what's happened in the Valley at large. It was started by free speech proponents like like Teal and Elon and yourself, some of the biggest free speech activists in the world today uh, in the tech world. And it's become run by people who, let's say, want to restrict free speech in the in the name of preventing harm, uh, or that, that's right. what they would say. Um, take us back to 20 plus years ago when you were running PayPal. Could you have foreseen or predicted that as the tech industry matured, uh, it would become you know more censorious or, or censorship would become more popular? No, I mean, if you look at polling from you know, say a decade ago, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, had a consensus in favor of free speech. And certainly if you go back 20 years to the founding of the the web and all those original web 1.0 companies, there was a real sense that uh, that all these companies were breaking down boundaries and borders and were democratizing access to financial services, payment systems, and then eventually speech. And it seemed to be um, pretty much consensus in Silicon Valley, this was a good thing. Um, you know, even remember, it was only what, roughly a, a decade or, or a dozen years ago where the then CEO of Twitter, Dick Costello, said that we're the free speech wing yes. of the free speech party. So it was pretty much conventional wisdom that opening up the world, connecting people, giving them access was a good thing. And you're right that in the last several years, it's really changed. And now the emphasis has been on restricting access, censorship, deplatforming, unpersoning. Uh, and you know, I think what PayPal is doing is particularly nefarious because it's bad enough to take away someone's sp free speech rights. But what they're doing is trying to starve out the political opposition. They're trying to yeah. deny them the ability to transact, to accept payments, to pay people, to run a business. And they're encouraging other tech companies to follow suit. I mean, that's definitely part of the agenda here is they're kind of leading the vanguard on this. And the so the the, the collective effect of, of these policies, if they were implemented widely, would be, again, not just to restrict the free speech rights of Americans, but to restrict their ability to make a living. And yeah. I think that's even worse. So this is, I mean, this was your baby. This was Elon's baby. This was Teal's baby. Have you guys tried to communicate to, to management uh, or is it so far removed? Um, like, you know, how do you make sense of that? It's it's pretty far removed at this point. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to reverse course because one of us lobs on a phone call. Um, I think the only thing they respond to really is public pressure. And so us saying what we think publicly is probably as much as we can do. Um, yeah. But um, look, if you look at the bios of the, it's interesting, if you go to the PayPal management page and you look at the bios of the leadership, and in particular, the CEO, what you'll see is about one paragraph on professional credentials and then like five paragraphs on, on basically left-wing activism. <laughs> and um, the CEOs receive like every woke award you can get. And... Um, and 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 so the company is working with many of those same groups who've given him uh, awards, and these are the the groups who are now defining uh, the blacklist in cooperation with PayPal. So it's groups like the ADL and SPLC, the Anti Defamation League and Southern Poverty Law Center, which historically did good work. I mean, to be sure, the original mission of these organizations was quite noble, which is to stand up to anti semitism or discrimination. The problem is that in recent years, these organizations have been kind of hijacked by a more conventional left-wing agenda, and they've gone very far afield of, of the mission they were originally created to support. And now they're kind of just standard left-wing groups. And so they're free to advocate on behalf of the cause they want, but they shouldn't be trusted to create blacklists of who should be allowed right. on the platform because they're simply highly partisan groups. Right. Um, they just can't be trusted to make an honest assessment of anybody from the other side of the political spectrum. And yet, 
Um, and yet yeah, this is who PayPal is deferring to. And you have to wonder, is this part of, of this woke capitalism game where, um, you know, you, you, the executive, uh, basically work with these groups, you basically give them the power to censor the political enemies in exchange, they give you awards and that advances your career up the woke corporate totem pole. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a scary quid pro quo, but this is appears to be the system that we're living in. It's ironic in, in so many ways, uh, the, the, the sort of the world capital game that you described, because, you know, a decade ago, plus there, you know, a lot of tech, there, there was a libertarian streak and, and they were worried that governments would be the one to kind of enforce a certain political monoculture. And it turns out that corporations just kind of did it on their own. They did it on their own, but also as we're learning in collusion with government. Right. Yeah. So more and more is coming out about this, but the head of trust and safety, the euphemistically named censorship and thought police at Twitter, Yoel Roth, had all these recurring meetings with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. And we're still finding out more about what that entailed, but it does appear that there's extensive cooperation between the various branches and agencies of the security state and these big tech companies. And so, you know, all of these, um, you know, all of these liberal apologists for big tech who were saying that, well, these are private companies, they should be able to do whatever they want. The most disingenuous argument ever, because uh, these very same people are supporting a bunch of bills running through Congress right now that are, that would regulate these companies in other ways. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the argument is they're private companies, they should be able to do whatever they want. But, but here's the thing is they're not acting alone. They're acting in concert with government officials. And actually we heard this, remember when Jen Psaki was the White House um, press secretary, she let the cat out of the bag saying that they were working with right. social networks to identify posts to be taken down. So um, I think more and more is going to come out about this. But um, but yeah, it's it's a really scary alliance now between our largest tech companies and um, politicians, the political establishment, and then the call it the permanent Washington establishment, the um, the security state. Yeah. And um, I mean, this is this is uh, approaching, you know, um, what is it? Uh, well, Elon called it like a uh, dark mirror territory or whatever. Black or, mirror territory. Black mirror territory. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is we're getting to the point now where it's looking more and more like the destination here is a big brother social credit like system. Yeah. Well, they're they're just trying to hold you accountable, whereas you do the same thing. You're trying to um, you're putting them in harm's way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, they yeah. live. They live in. They live in such a bubble where everybody agrees with them, and they have so much entitlement. Um, and it's such a closed loop that any, uh, if you subject them to any criticism or public debate whatsoever, that's uh, deemed to be harassment, and again, is is jeopardizing their safety. Uh, but of course, that same argument doesn't apply when they engage in. Um, criticism of the other side. I mean, look, it's not, it's not harassment. It's, it's, it's public debate, you know? Yeah. Um, and then these are people who are seeking to control the public debate. So they can't be immune from criticism. Yeah. L l let's, so you've been in the Valley, you know, or you've been in, you know, operating in tech last 25 plus years. Um, let's kind of trace the evolution a bit for, you know, some of these topics, like when did the collusion start to start to begin? Um, or when did, kind of this monoculture, political monoculture, intellectual monoculture really start to, to take shape? Like, is it just in the last, you know, um, five years or, or, or six years, or, or did there start to be cracks where, when even you were running Yammer or so to speak, that you start to see, you saw this, uh, kind of monoculture? Well, I think Silicon Valley has always been very liberal. And I, you know, I think that, you know, if you were to measure it by political party affiliation, it was 90 plus percent, you know, Democrat. So even back then, um, so that, that part of it hasn't changed, but I think that what changed is, I think you probably have to trace it to the election of Trump in 2016, where all of a sudden all these liberal elites who thought that, you know, uh, connecting people via social networks was a good thing. We're opening up the world. And you saw this again during the Arab Spring that we're bringing about all this positive social change. We're allowing uh, populist social movements to take rise. 
Now, all of a sudden, the narrative completely flipped where it's like, oh, my God, what have we done? Social networking helped elect Trump. Uh, you know, this was a little bit too much populism for them. And now I, I believe that I think th that story is largely nonsense. I think this idea that like Facebook in particular or, or social networking more generally was the reason Trump got elected, I think is is ridiculous. I think it's a scapegoating yeah. explanation. I think there's a lot of other explanations that you could point to, starting with the fact that Hillary Clinton just ran a really terrible campaign. But um, but in any event, um, S Silicon Valley, I'd say social networking in particular, became the scapegoat for Trump's election. And I think that after that, you started to see a flip where um, certainly the people running big tech start to question themselves. Um, the media similarly, which had been the champions of the First Amendment, now sort of bought into this censorship agenda and uh, and abandoned the principles on which the entire media industry is based. Um, and so you, you had this big um, flip, I think, and it, it all traces back to kind of, you know, yeah. Trump as the big disruptor. I, I think it was certainly an accelerant, but I noticed mm -hmm. things happening even before then. I, I was at Product Hunt, you know, in um, 2013 to 2015, and I noticed that there was this turn, um, at least between tech and media, and media started to become just much more hostile to to tech. Um, in the mm -hmm. beginning, it was, you know, all these silly apps, and then it was, oh, these platforms are getting too big. And, and I... Yeah, I, I think Trump was an accelerant, but there seemed to be something in the water beforehand where either tech was getting too big for its britches or maybe it was threatening media in the case of the media tech debate. But um, just that these tools that people had seen, you know, as beneficiaries of things like the Arab Spring start to really be questioned. Yeah, well, I think part of what was happening during all of this time was that the big tech companies were getting bigger and bigger and they're getting more valuable and they were dominating the economy and people began to realize how powerful they were. And how wealthy they were. And there are, I think, very legitimate questions about the power of some of these monopolies and how they should be reined in. I think for the good of the startup ecosystem, I don't think we're going to have a healthy startup ecosystem if uh, Google and Apple will, are allowed to do whatever they want. I mean, they basically have the most powerful tech monopoly ever, which is the mobile operating system duopoly. So I think there are real legitimate questions about that. But what we've seen over the last half dozen years is that the, the the party in power is not interested so much in limiting the power of these companies, but in co-opting it. They want to work with these companies to use that power to censor their political opponents and, and control the narrative in the political debate. That's what's scary is there's this cooperation that's developed. And you see it in the Senate hearings, you know, the Judiciary Committee. On the one hand, you'll hear the senators directly tell the leaders of these companies that we want you to take down more content, you know, even though those senators could not pass a bill to take down that content that would directly violate the first amendment. They are telling these CEOs, we want you to take down more content. And then in virtually the next breath, they're saying that you guys have these monopolies that we need to take a look at, you know, we need to uh, pass some legislation to, to rein you guys in. So they're hanging the sort of Damocles over their heads and then saying, well, we want you to do this, this, and this. And it's been very effective. I think that it has, um, you know, it's created pressure from the top down for these companies to uh, engage in uh, to, or to put their thumb on the scale of, of democracy and, and censor um, opponents of the, the, the people in power. And then on the other hand, you also have <clears throat> the, the problem of bottom-up pressure, which is coming from the activist employee base. And so I think the leaders of these companies have found themselves really in this, um, you know, in this, um, this sort of pressure cooker of, again, pressure coming from the top, but also pressure coming from the employees. And they haven't really been particularly courageous in standing up to it. Um, they've pretty much just given in continuously, yeah. which is why what Elon's doing has been so, you know, noteworthy and, and striking. Oh, yeah. No, what we're going to get to, to, to Elon. Yeah. Did you um did you experience any of this activism when, when you were a uh, CEO or operating, or have you only experienced it as a VC kind of you know um with your companies? Not really. I mean, um, you know, back when we were doing PayPal, it was too early. The, the company had a strong libertarian culture. When I was doing Yammer, even though um, which was two thousand eight to two thousand twelve, and then I was at Microsoft for a couple of years after that. Um, this was a, a tool to allow the employees to communicate very freely in a company. It was basically like Slack 
0. Okay. 0.5 or something. And we didn't really have these problems of um, that that Slack has of channels being hijacked to become a way for activist employees to you know kind of unionize and and um, create create problems for the company. So it, it was it was you know it, it just wasn't happening yet. It feels like this started to happen maybe you know a few years later. Um, yeah, maybe it was a cascading effect where you saw they, they saw one company, you know, one set of activists be successful, and then, um, and then, and then the rest just followed. And you know, if companies like Google let it happen, you know, who, who well, are, well, well, what was uh, the the Matthew Iglesias piece, the Great Awakening, written? Yes. That was sort of like the, I think it was, that was like the naming of the phenomenon that was happening. Yeah. I I don't know if it was written in 2014 or or if he wrote it about, you know, what was happening in 2014, but it was talking about this phenomenon where there was this, you know, um, surge of activism happening in college campuses, people, you know, and, and the rest of the country saying, wow, this is, this is really crazy. And then people on the left are saying, Hey, it's just a couple of, you know, a couple of campuses, a few campuses. Um, and it turns out that that activity spilled out to the rest of the corporate world. And what's fascinating is that you experienced this at Stanford in the 90s. I, I remember seeing right. a talk that Peter Thiel gave where he was talking about sort of the the rise of this like anti-West, you know, um, rhetoric and, and stuff happening from professors, not only students, but professors. And it feels like it was prophetic or it feels like it could have been today, but mm -hmm. you guys saw this 30 years ago. So like, right. talk, talk a, bit, a bit about kind of like having that vantage point. Yeah, well, okay, so, so, so let's back up. Um, so I think you're right. The interesting thing about this woke phenomenon is that it spans across corporate America. You have so-called woke capitalism. You've got you know ESG the, the, with boards of directors and all these uh, global the uh, nonprofits, the your NGOs. You've got the think tank world. You've got the media. Um, you've got Hollywood. It's a um, it's it's a phenomenon that spans across virtually every major institution in our society, and so the question is, some, how does something like that happen? Um, and I think it can only happen as a result of a shift in attitudes of an entire class of people, which in this case is the the professional class, the class of people who have college degrees. And the polling data really bears this out. If you look at uh, polling data on virtually any uh, socio-cultural issue um the biggest divide in the country it's not over you know between race or gender it's it's actually on the single variable of whether you have a college degree or not um so the the, the political science has done a lot of work on this is roy to he's written many blogs about it but basically there's a 30 point gap roughly in voting patterns and political party affiliation based on whether you are professional class or working class and professional class, meaning you have at least one college degree and working class means that you're high school educator or, but, but not a college degree. And this is the single biggest um, divide in, in the electorate is that the attitudes and beliefs of people who have college degrees is just very different than those of the working class of the country. Um, so how do you explain that? I mean, I think it's, downstream of the fact that the universities got taken over a couple of generations ago by the far left. And so the, you know, the quid pro quo of our civilization is that if you want the economic and social advancement that a college degree grants you, you have to go to one of these schools and you submit to voluntary re-education for four years. And I mean, you're basically indoctrinated in this ideology. Um, I mean, it's the only way to explain why, um, you you know the people graduating the institutions come out with these far left views, um, which are just very different than the rest of the country. Um, so I tend to think that's that's what's happening. And you know Andrew Sullivan has this line: "We all live on campus now." Yeah, um, we all live on campus because campuses indoctrinated two generations of Americans, and now they have these these views. Right. Now it's not like every single person who goes to college believes in it. I tend to think that there's three groups. There's um, the true believers who are maybe 10% and then like maybe 1% rebel against it. And they become kind of either conservative journalists or founders, which is why I can stay in business with the views that I have. Um, and then, you know, like roughly 89, 90% become are, are sort of the herd. They tend to go populate the ranks of the, um, 
the professional elite, they go get the the well-paying corporate jobs. It's the McKinsey consultants and the bankers at Goldman Sachs and so on. And then the true believers go do the low-paying professional jobs. It's the think tanks and the foundation world and the HR, uh, you know, the HR police at uh, corporations, the, you know, the enforcers (laughs) of the regime. Um. And, and, you know, they staff the ranks of uh, activist groups in the Democratic Party and, and things like that. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how, how this how this works. And um, it's produced this broad phenomenon of all of our institutions going woke at the same time, because they all, you know, the, the, all our, all of our college graduates have kind of, again, breathed in this ideology and they either support it or know not to oppose it. Yeah, I mean, um, and 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 I and I do just to finish the thought. I, I I do think that um, this explains a huge amount of the sense of conflict and division in our society. Because just to go back to professional class versus working class, two thirds of the country is working class. Only one third of the country is professional class. So the professional class holds beliefs and values that are at odds with the working class. And they hold an ideology that is um, it's very different to and it's hostile to the beliefs of the working class in many cases. So you have a country, you have a democracy in which most of the people don't agree with the agenda that's being foisted on them by their institutions. And um, and but but the people running these institutions, again, they have a very different ideology. So I tend to think this is the. Um, this is the the fundamental disconnect. Now, the people running these institutions are always claiming that what they're doing is in the interest of democracy. But democracy is you let the majority of the, the population uh, exercise its will and get its way. And that's not what's happening here. Um, it's this Orwellian doublespeak where in the name of democracy, you're doing things like censoring one side of the debate, probably the side of the debate that has more, has the numbers, has more support. Yeah. Uh, for most of the people. Uh, Certainly what you've seen is that, you know, in the most recent election, we're very close to being, it's a 50-50 country, but it's 50-50 with our big tech companies engaged in shadow banning and broad scale censorship and putting their thumb on the scale. Um, And you have to wonder if we had a completely fair and level playing field, if big tech wasn't engaging in censorship on behalf of the, the sort of the elite, um, and the media wasn't constantly covering for the elite of which they're a part. You'd have to think that maybe these elections would go a little differently. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Quick math. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your product or service, the more margin you have and the more money you keep. But with higher expenses on materials, employees, distribution, and borrowing, everything costs more. So to reduce costs and headaches, Smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform. That's one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required, accessed from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems and improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 businesses have graduated to NetSuite, so do the math and make the move. Startup founders and execs running scaling businesses know all too well how easily their systems break down and expenses skyrocket. NetSuite is a proven way to cut costs and boost performance. And by popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen. netsuite.com slash zen. If you don't already subscribe to Turpentine's industry-leading newsletters, like our new daily AI newsletter, Emergent Behavior, or Media Empires, you should. But that's not what I'm here to tell you about. The platform we use to power these newsletters is called Beehive, and it's excellent. First of all, it was started by the same early team who helped build Morning Brew into a $75 million newsletter business. And they built Beehive to offer that same powerful functionality to anyone sending emails. From essayists to business owners, the platform is beautiful, their text editor is intuitive, and they help you scale your audience with custom growth features. Beehive has powerful tools to help you monetize your content. You can easily launch paid subscriptions or pursue an advertising model. The Beehive platform will even connect you to premium brands to sponsor your newsletter. 
Not only do we use them, but thousands of the top newsletters in the world also use them, like Milk Road, Blockworks, The Lindy Newsletter, and so many more. Beehive's founder hooked up Moment of Zen listeners with a sweet deal. Get 20% off for three months with code MOZ. Visit beehive.com, that's B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com, to get started. Yep, yeah, but Bology is a line that when people talk about, you know, fighting for democracy or fighting for journalism, what they really mean is fighting for Democrats and fighting for journalists, like it's a class-based <laughs> <laughs> thing right. rather than kind of a, you know, idea. idea. Um, right. Well, if you're if you're if you're in power, um, you obviously want to perpetuate that power and you want to insulate yourself from accountability. And so, like every ruling elite that's ever been in power, you're willing to use tactics of censorship. That's why that's always the reason for censorship is that the the people with the power want to protect that power and they want to make themselves immune from criticism. And part of the way they do that is with this, like, again, Orwellian relabeling of terms, where if you criticize them, that's harassment. They're allowed to uh, criticize and attack you and deplatform you and take away your speech rights and starve you out. But that's just, um, you know, appropriate punishment for people who won't behave. But but your criticism of them is harassment, right? And then that doesn't even include the um, the banning. And now, as we've learned, the the shadow banning. Yeah. The um. Well, what's ironic is that if the if far left did take over the um, you know, uh, academia, you'd expect that their views, you know, that they would fight for the working class, or that they would be more sympathetic with the working class. And and alternatively, it, I guess one irony is that you know you yourself are you know a Stanford graduate, a very successful you know entrepreneur, and yet you've gravitated or, or found yourself with more working class views today on issues like um, trade, on issues like foreign policy, uh, maybe even you know big tech regulation. Um, and so my question to you is like, have your views evolved, how have your views evolved as well? Because when you know um, these are more working class views today, but but in the nineties, you know. Um, like, were you, there were maybe left wing views. Were, were you right. more on the left wing back in the nineties or were you more of a kind of libertarian in the nineties, but then saw how the world changed and then changed your views, you know, as the facts change, so to speak. Well, some of it's been a change in my views and some of it's been um, the world changing around me and relabeling what used to be liberal views as, um, as some sort of, you know, conservative or far right views. I mean, being a free speech advocate was a liberal position in the 1970s. I feel like I haven't, I've always believed in that. I haven't changed on that, but now somehow that's like a right-wing position. Um, you know, for a long time now, I've been in favor of um, the liberal position on a number of what I call the old social issues. Um, you know, like, I don't know, gay marriage or cannabis legalization, or, you know, even on abortion, you know, I, I don't think that abolition is going to fly in this country. I think we have to find um, more, more of a compromise. Um, then it's going to end up looking, I think, a lot like Europe. Um, so, you know, on the old social issues, um, I, uh, you know, I've always been pretty liberal. Um, so I don't think I've changed that much, but I think that what's happened is that the elite in our country has kind of bought into these very liberal ideas uh, in terms of um, you know, again, in terms of censorship and and restrict and restrictions, and um, yeah, I just think it's 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 deeply liberal, and I and I also think that it, it, this this collusion between, you know, it's not just on censorship; it's also the they fully embrace the power of monopolies, and fully embrace the uh, collusion between big tech and our security state. So liberals who used to be quite skeptical of the power of the state or quite skeptical of the power of monopolies have now fully bought that idea provided they can use that power and align it with their agenda. And I think that's, that's pretty scary. Let's do foreign policy. Have have you always been kind of a, a a realist there? Um, Or have have, have you like in the 90s, were you against the Iraq war in early 2000s or like, how have your thoughts informed? No, I mean, so so this, this is one of those issues where I've just evolved by like watching what's been going on. I mean, like everybody else, when we got involved in the Iraq war, I supported it because I thought they were telling us the truth. I mean, they yeah. told us that the Bush administration did that Saddam Hussein was in cahoots with Al Qaeda and they had WMD programs. And in fact, we knew where those programs were. That's literally what the administration told us. It was all lies. Um, they lied us into that war. 
Um, the war did nothing to improve American security. We destabilized the Middle East. We turned Iraq into an Iranian proxy state. We um, it, it, we created a huge, uh, again, de destabilization, which created a huge um, a refugee problem. That spilled over into Syria, which is another yeah. intervention that we, we bungled. Um, we got involved in Afghanistan. I think the original motivation for going into Afghanistan was just because they actually did support Al Qaeda and um which um attacked us in 9-11. But then we stayed there in an open-ended occupation for 20 years. And the entire time we were told that we were winning and the country was being transformed into a you know democracy. And everything turned out to be just a lie. So and then of course you know I could get to the the just the actual numbers around this. It cost us all these Foreign interventions in the Middle East cost something like eight trillion dollars, and the number of deaths is just staggering. So you know, almost a million direct deaths uh, from from all the wars that we we launched, and I've seen excess mortality numbers as high as five million. So you know, we unleash staggering death and destruction, and um, so I don't know how you live through that over the past twenty years and not rethink American foreign policy. You know, yeah. not recognize that 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 American foreign policy has been overly activist and overly interventionist and has totally blown up and backfired on us and blown up in our faces. And the sad thing is the same people who got us involved in that foreign policy, they're still there. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the foreign policy establishment, the blob. There's been very little accountability for all those people. In fact, most of them have moved to the Democratic Party. They're very comfortable with the idea of state power. Um, so. Um, you know, but there was a small circle of of uh, in 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 the forum in foreign policy who accurately predicted what would happen, and that that's basically the realist camp. And of course, they're very out of favor with um with the elites in Washington because they um they wanted to restrain American involvement, and um and that's not a popular message for anyone in Washington to hear. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've. I guess I've become more realist over time by virtue of just seeing the results of our policies. In, in the same way that response to COVID became so politicized that once Trump, you know, um, expressed skepticism, then the other side just, you know, kind of ramped up the the opposite take. Like, is it because Trump um, and Pu you know Putin were rumored to be you know were friendly that um, you know the left became so anti Russia? that they would be like pro war, you know, pro involvement in a way that they never would have, you know, in the past. Like, is, is there another scenario where Trump accidentally tweeted or said something like, you know, we should back out uh, or we should be isolationists or sorry, we should get involved. And then everyone else would just say, no, we shouldn't like, do you, is there some real, you know, logic or evolution in, in the sort of response to um, kind of, you know, engagement in, in Ukraine, or is it really just like the other side thinks this and thus it's put aside? Well, I think one of the, the the big things that happened during the Trump administration is you had the whole Russia collusion hoax where uh, they basically invented it, it wasn't even one hoax. It was like a series of hoax. You had the you know, you had the um, the Alpha Bank hoax. You had the whole Mueller investigation and it would just it went on and on for for years. And um, basically what happened is that the, the, the left scapegoated not just social networking, but also Vladimir Putin for Trump's election. Presumably they were working together somehow. And this is what caused Trump's election. And then that led to the whole Russia collusion hoax. But by the way, the whole thing started with the Steele dossier, which again, we know was a piece of phony opposition research that was commissioned by the Clinton campaign's law firm, Perkins Coey, paying a British spy. Um, and, and it's kind of metastasized from there. The result of all of that has been this intense Russophobia that's developed in the U.S. Now, I mean, Putin was never a good guy. I mean, he's a thug. He's he has made Russia more authoritarian. Um, but I think that what happened over the last several years is that um, is that we came to view him as like this personification of evil, and um, and I think that that has contributed to the way we perceive this uh, Ukraine war for sure. Yeah. And, 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 and to be fair, on the right, there has been kind of um, at least some factions of kind of like uh, glamorizing 
you know, uh, some elements of Russian culture or sympathizing at least like, for example, when this, um, you know, uh, criminal bout that got um, released, the, one of the first things he did um, is he went on TV and he talked about how in America they have 72 genders. And, and you know, if like uh, he was kind of criticizing America's social issues and some people on the right might might sympathize with that. So I think that's bit- overblown. I mean, you know, I follow a lot of people on the right and I've heard nobody uh, really pr- praising Vladimir Putin or holding him up as the kind of leader we want to emulate. Um, I feel like that's something that the the left accuses the right of doing, which is, I mean, look, uh, we can get into my position on the Ukraine war, but I'm routinely accused of being pro Putin yeah. because my because I don't want us to get in World War Three over Ukraine. I want us to pursue America's vital interests. I don't. I'm not uh, pro Russian. I mean, there's nothing about the Russian regime that I want to emulate. This is precisely why I'm against censorship and I'm concerned about the growing relationship between the security state and big tech because I want to protect our civil liberties and freedoms. Um, so there's nothing that um, that I like about Putin's regime. Um, so I, you know, I, I tend to think this idea that the, the right somehow has sympathy for him is just overblown. I, I think the point is just that, you know, we believe that, and this is actually even on the right, it's a pretty small group that we should, that American foreign policy should be guided by what's in America's best interest. And that's the discussion we need to have. And, um, you know, the, the, um, and then that's just not the the conversation we, we, we have on, on Ukraine. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey all Eric Torenberg here. I'm hearing more and more that founders want to get profitable and do more with less, especially with engineering. Listen, I love your 30-year-old ex-fang senior software engineer as much as the next guy, but honestly, I can't afford them anymore. Founders everywhere are trying to turn to global talent, but boy, is it a hassle to do at scale, from sourcing to interviewing to on-the-ground operations and management. That's why I teamed up with Sean Lanahan, who's been building engineering teams in Vietnam at a very high level for over five years to help you access global engineering without the headache. Squad, Sean's new company, takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent so you don't have to. With teams across Asia and South America, we can cover you no matter which time zone you operate in. Their engineers follow your process and use your tools. They work with React, Next.js, or your favorite front-end frameworks. And on the back end, they're experts at Node, Python, Java, and anything under the sun. Full disclosure, it's going to cost more than the random person you found on Upwork that's doing two hours of work per week but billing you for 40. But you'll get premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost. Our engineers are vetted top 1% talent and actually working hard for you every day. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Head to choose squad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. I want to get to big tech issues because you you talked about you, you Ukraine a lot on on other shows. Um, on, on on big tech, w- one challenge I have. So you've been kind of vocal that um, there should be some form of, of regulation because these companies have gotten too too powerful. You mentioned this, you know, duopoly or, or, or oligopoly um, of of the biggest companies. At the same time, you know, there's um, you know, uh, you said this in an old interview. There's there's no lobbyist for the social media company that doesn't exist yet, right? And there's always a risk with with regulations that um, you know they entrench the existing um, you know power structure. Right. Or you don't get them quite right, and you know we saw with with this sort of Microsoft that the answer maybe was le- wasn't as much regulation as much as it was just new new company innovation. So why couldn't that happen here, or or like why why are you still a, a fan of uh, of regulation? Well, because I, I just I, I think that these monopolies are incredibly powerful, and I do think that. As the startup ecosystem matures, or as the technology landscape matures, they will start to uh, dominate. And as as their business gets more mature, they will start to dominate all of the business opportunities that are downstream of their current monopoly. So, for example, just take Google Search for, for a minute. Um, I mean, that business is a pretty mature business. If you look at the percentage of Google searches that now lead you off-site to a non-Google property, it's now less than fifty percent. And the reason is because what they do is they keep advancing their own properties in the Google search. They rank them higher and they keep giving you reasons never to leave Google. And this is what Yelp's been complaining about for a long time. I think we're starting to see with Apple, they said they would never get into the advertising business and compete with their apps. They're now starting to do that. 
um, they're always going to favor their own applications on the in their app store and on the you know on their operating system monopoly if they can. And the problem with that is that there's no reason for VCs to keep funding innovation on these platforms if the platform owner eventually will just usurp that value for itself. I mean, if you prove out the idea, have it be successful, and then the operating system will just say, "Oh yeah, that looks good." We'll just copy it, cut off your distribution, of, and and push the firehose to our own app. I mean, stuff like that. Like, you just can't have a healthy tech ecosystem right. if that's allowed. Now, I actually think that. You mentioned Microsoft. I actually think that the government intervention there did work. Um, you know what could have happened? We could be we could have had an alternative future where Microsoft moves seamlessly from uh, dominating the the desktop operating system to then dominating the browser, and then from there it, they could have realized pretty short in pretty short order that having great search was kind of the key feature of the browser, then dominated search. And it kind of gone on from there. And you could have imagined a world in which um, Microsoft extended its desktop monopoly into controlling a vast part of the web, and the web would have been much less free. And the thing that stopped them from doing that is the government's interference with Microsoft, that the Netscape lawsuit and so on. It really like crippled the company. I mean, I'm not I'm saying that it was like a model of like effective yeah. regulation. I just think that it like hamstrung the company so badly. And it bogged them down so much that it allowed other companies to to innovate and and then you know create yeah. create their businesses. So I'm not saying like again that it's like never ending litigation is the role model here, but I do think that we it's worth taking steps to restrain these monopolies because they will eventually end. Yeah, the, the, the they will eventually become gatekeepers who favor right. themselves at the expense of innovative startups. And um, and then Silicon Valley will look a lot more like Hollywood or something like that, where, um, yes, there's some creativity and entrepreneurship, but it's like very constrained and the studios kind of control everything. And, um, you know, the creators kind of have to go hat in hand to the studios for distribution. And, um, and the studios keep the bulk of the, you know, they, they capture the, the bulk of the value. Um, we don't want, I don't think we want the technology so, world to look like the entertainment world. So what, what practice, like uh, if Chris Dixon were here, he would talk about, oh, we just need to advance, you know, Web3 and, and that kind of thing. But what, what regulations would you like, would you have liked acquisitions blocked, you know, like Facebook and Instagram or WhatsApp, or would you like, like, should Apple, you know, take down its 30% rate to something like what, what more practically would you, would you like to see? I don't think the the ban on acquisitions is necessarily the way to go because uh, the question is what creates a healthy startup ecosystem and um and you know there are so few good outcomes in the startup world that if you take away M and A well now I mean we used to have there's IPOs that window's been frozen there are SPACs that's gone away there's M and A you know which now uh, because the regime in Washington is really against M and A it's like very difficult so you're 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 foreclosing the um, the good opportunity, the, the sort of exit opportunities. And um, certainly there's so many failed startups. We know that the vast majority fail that you do need some good outcomes to justify the risk that you're taking on the front end. And so, so this is one of the problems is I think that if you are going to um, limit M&A, you want to do it in a very targeted way. And because I think right now, acquirers aren't really clear on what's being stopped. Like, for example, that Facebook acquisition of a VR app that was blocked or, I mean, wasn't Amazon blocked or, or maybe they're going to get blocked for acquiring the Roomba or something like that. So these acquisitions that seem, that don't seem problematic from a competitive, yeah. a, from an antitrust standpoint, because you're dealing with markets that are so nascent, you can't really claim that somebody has dominant market share in a market that you're not even sure exists yet. Like that's not where we should be interfering. Um, certainly I could imagine acquisitions in mature, well-defined markets where it would just be so accretive to the market share of the dominant player that you'd want to stop it. But I don't think we should be interfering in, again, in, in yeah. nascent markets that you're not even sure will right. exist in the future. Let companies um, build the capabilities they need to even test whether there's something there. Uh, like, for example, VR. I mean, Facebook's being blocked from acquiring this VR company, while on the other hand, Wall Street's questioning Facebook saying, is this even a thing, you know? Yeah. So, so they so can't what both should they be, be doing instead. 
Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's, so what should, what should the government be doing instead? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, okay. So we're not going to block acquisitions. Yeah. I think, I think the, um, I, I, well, so, so, so not all monopolies are created equal. I think that the most dominant monopolies are the operating system monopolies. It's Google and Facebook and the mobile app stores. And I think that they're the big picture should be, they should not be able to impose rules on startups or, or apps that they themselves are not subject to. They cannot preference their own apps over third-party apps. I mean, that's the big picture. And I think there's probably a lot of ways of enforcing that, you know, there's side loading and so forth. But uh, but I think that's the big picture. It's just not letting them do things that um that they that they themselves that they exempt themselves from. They have to play by the same rules as everybody else. And um, you probably like something around censorship too. Well, the problem on censorship is that I don't think you can get a bipartisan majority to agree. You're not going to get 60 votes. I, I don't think you get 60 votes. Um, we know that Section 230 is a, is a problem because um, what's happening is that the tech companies are having or, uh, having their cake and eating it too, right? Where the whole idea of Section 230 is we're going to treat you as um, not as a publisher, but as a distributor. So you're not going to be liable for things that the way a publisher was would. But then at the same time, as we've discovered at Twitter, these companies have been exercising editorial control yes. over what gets published on their platforms. That fundamentally doesn't make sense. That's irreconcilable. So that needs to be fixed. I mean, if you're going to act as a um, as an editor and, and publisher, you need to have publisher liability. Now, I think that it would be a mistake to to get rid of 230 altogether. I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think it's performed a very important purpose. Right. And um, if a, a social network is willing to act as a true distributor, then they should be able to keep that provision. So the problem there, I think that's the way it should get resolved. But the problem is that I don't know that Democrats or Republicans agree on that issue. They both agree that something should be done, but fundamentally Democrats want more censorship right. and Republicans want less. And I'm afraid that if the Republicans sign on to a Democrat bill, they're going to ultimately get hoodwinked. And they're going to end up supporting something that promotes more censorship rather than less. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. But I'm not I'm not super optimistic about that yet. Maybe in 2024, there'll be a different majority and, um, and we might, might be able to get some Section 230 reform. Yeah. I mean, let's zoom out for a quick thought experiment. Let's say you're talking to a, you know, a Stanford uh, student at the same time that you were at Stanford, who, who was more on the left. But you, you mm -hmm. both you know, have seen the, the, what happened in the next 30 years. And he said something like, hey, um, you know, sent, uh, free speech was a great tool when it led to more social progress. But once we, you know, got more powerful and owned some of the cultural centers, now it turns out actually censorship is, is a great tool when it comes to social progress. And isn't the goal of social progress? Like, look at the last, the over the last 20 years, we've gotten so many other groups of people more involved and we made all the social progress. Um, David, isn't that like the, are you missing the forest from the trees? Like, isn't that what, what it's all about? What, what would you say to that person? Well, who defines social progress? Uh, that's up. That's up to democratic majorities to define, and um, and so what what that elitist view is that you've just described is the the rationalization for uh, for a small number of elites who have institutional power to suppress the will of the majority and interfere in elections, and then of course those very same people will puff out their chests and say we're the protectors and defenders of democracy. No, if you truly believe in democracy, you would allow. The people to have a voice and then let the chips fall where they may in terms of how they vote. The reason why I've become more populist is because it aligns with civil liberties. Um, the the people, I think there, there's there's a natural alliance there between the people and people who want to protect civil liberties versus the elites who want to restrict those liberties so they can enforce more control. By the way, that's changed a little bit. I think in the 70s, um, civil libertarians would say look to the courts or um, you know more elite opinion to protect speech from what might be uh, popular majorities who want to restrict it. Um, but anyway, it's it's flipped a little bit. Yeah. But the, the you know the, the person who I've heard made the make the argument similar to to what you've made is um, is Erdogan in Turkey who basically said, look the the thing that you know, you guys, you, the West, America don't understand is that in the Middle East, democracy is just the bus that people take to get where they're going. Yeah. Once they get in power, once they, you know, once they have the reins, well, that's the end of the democracy, right? They've, they've, they've used it to get where they want to get to. 
And that's kind of the argument you're you're making there, which is, oh, well, now that we have the power, we've we've defined we're going to define what social progress is. We don't need civil liberties anymore. We don't need free speech. Um, those yeah. are not people who really believed in free speech or democracy. Well, what do you say to the more perhaps nuanced or subtle argument that um, this is kind of like the logical conclusion of of liberalism? Um, and, and you know, I heard Peter Thiel once say something like, uh, you know, the same way that you know, communists say, uh, you know, real communists has never been tried. It's almost like real liberalism has never been tried. And we just need to go back to, to the way things were, you know, a couple decades ago. Um, do you think there's merit to the, the argument that, hey, this is just like the logical conclusion of, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a confused movement that prioritizes both liberty and equality? And those things are, are at odds. And people like Barry Weiss, who are, you know, doing great work, um, or Sam Harris, or et cetera, are just by trying to get back, they're just like a little bit confused that there, there is no going back. Well, if so, so if, if you go back to the the 90s, when, um, you know, the Fukuyama essay, the end of history was very popular. And, you know, the idea was that we're, we're reaching the end of history, because there's nothing better than yeah. uh, democratic capitalism. And so we're all going to converge on that the whole world will and our biggest problem is going to be boredom. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where everyone thought, right? And I, there, there's a part of the argument that I think is must be true, which is if we believe in democratic capitalism, then surely we believe that that must be an ideal end state for everyone in the world. I think the time frame was way off. Um, I think it turns out that cultures and civilizations are very stubborn things, and there's a lot of other cultures in the world which aren't embracing those things, and we can't force it on them. It's going to take time for it to evolve. But I think the other thing that was really wrong about that view of history was this boredom idea. See, I think that as we approached the end of history, as Fukuyama um, defined it, our biggest problem was not boredom, it was hubris. Yeah. As exemplified by Fukuyama's thesis itself, that, you know, that we're just, we're at the end of history, there's nothing new to learn, there'll be no, no other challenges. And in our hubris, in thinking we knew it all, we lost our tolerance because when you have all the answers, there's no reason to allow a debate or a free marketplace of ideas. And so it became acceptable to, to censor the part of the debate. And th I mean, this is basically the woke theology, right? Is that we understand what virtue looks like. And if we can just enforce that result, you know, the only people who are against our agenda are they're just bad people. And we just have to basically punish them and, you know, silence them and deplatform them, unperson them. Um, so that that basically that that's basically what we're living through is this. Um, it's like this hubristic form of of liberalism where we already know all the answers. There's nothing more to figure out, and we just need to enforce our will. And what is actually produced is not the kind of democratic capitalism that we thought we were getting at the end of history, but something that's much more repressive and nefarious. And it's not that it's not capitalist and it's not that it's not democracy, but it also doesn't feel like the, the free democratic capitalist society that we thought we were getting. It's sort of, um, you know, it's more of this like uh, managerial capitalism, but you know, kind of the, what, what Burnham predicted uh, where it's kind of ruled by experts and technocrats and mid-level managers, and they kind of control everything. And um, again, you have this collusion between the technology platforms and the media and the state and uh, what you're allowed to do and say is closely prescribed by, by all these folks. And um, so it's, it's a very weird form of democratic capitalism that again, feels like it's much more oppressive yeah. than we thought it was going to be 30 years ago. Yeah. There's a, a lot of ironies. Um, I want to talk about institutional reform. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we briefly talked about, you know, uh, how can you reform an institution? You can, uh, you know, government can get involved. You can start, uh, you know, new ones. Um, I think for the last, you know, decade or so, you know, I mean, we've been talking about this kind of institutional capture by a non-democratic, i.e. not representing the majority view. And if you said, okay, how do you recapture those institutions? I think for the last, you know, decade, there's been this view that you can't, they're just too entrenched whether it's, um, you know, you talk about the foreign policy establishment or, you know, call, like the deep state more broadly, or like the school system, or even the media, Th these things are just too hard to, um, to recapture. Now, 
now we're seeing it happen in some extent to media and you're, you're a part of it um, with, with what you're doing at, at all in. Um, but we have, um, and, and you, we have some people who go so far to say that you can't recapture them. You know, if Balaji was here, he'd say, not only do you have to create a new institution, you have to create new countries, uh, new, new governments <laughs> because they're just so far gone. But what we have in the last couple of months is we have Elon coming in and basically recapturing Twitter and kind of resetting it from, from the ground up uh, in, in, in some ways. Now, um, you know, I don't know how many, and he's the richest person on earth. And even he, plus, you know, like if you, him, Teal said, we want to take over PayPal, or we want to take, like, you know, you, if you, maybe you could do one other, like that's not a probably a scalable solution, but has it made you re- kind of rethink what's possible uh, when it comes to institutional reform? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, I think we need a multifaceted solution to this problem. Part of it is going to be creating new institutions and alternatives like we've seen in alternative media. Part of it, it, though, I think has to be um, revitalizing and reforming existing institutions because some of them are just too important and too powerful just to completely concede. And then part of it as well is using um, democratic accountabilities. We're going to need to use state power to rein in some of these excesses. So for example, the power of these monopolies does need to be reined in. I don't think they can be allowed just to do whatever they want. Um, you're starting to see this model where, you know, like with, with DeSantis in Florida, the way that he stood up to Disney, where <clears throat> conservatives, I think, are getting a little more comfortable with this idea of using using elected officials to stand up to um to uh, this sort of uh, to, to big corporations and uh, not letting them run roughshod over um, over the rights of ordinary citizens. And so I, I do think we're going to need to there needs to be some sort of, of democratic change if we're going to rein in uh, these big tech companies, because I, I, I don't see a way ultimately to restore the, the free speech rights and the rights to, to make a living like the, the PayPal problem without some sort of, um, you know, government involvement. I mean, there's only one Elon and he doesn't have the means to buy every single tech company and reform it. Yeah. Right. So about a decade ago, um, you know, Charlie Rose was interviewing Larry Page and, uh, he said, or someone was interviewing and said, what's your approach to philanthropy? And Larry Page said, um, I would give all my money to Elon. Actually, that would be better because what he could do with his companies is better than any money I could give to, to charity. And I say that to say that, you know, maybe there's a world where Larry Page has a, you know, heroic character arc and, you know, cons- tries to retake over Google or something. But like, I, I wonder if Elon could inspire, you know, yet another set of billionaires who has ties to one of these existing companies and say, hey, let's just do what Twitter did. Well, one hopes so. I mean, and there's been others too. Remember when Brian Armstrong uh, yes. had that policy at Coinbase where he said, listen, uh, we're going to leave our politics at the door when you come to work. We're only going to discuss politics if it's directly relevant to Coinbase. Otherwise, let's not engage in these divisive conversations, basically restoring the old etiquette yeah. of just not discussing politics at work. Of course, there's a total freak out. The New York Times wrote a hit piece, yeah. but um, he stuck to his guns. He offered a voluntary severance, kind of similar to what, what Elon's done. If people didn't like the new policy, I think 5% took it. And a year later, he says the best thing we ever did, everyone at the company is there because not not because they're trying to you know, institute some you know, unrelated political agenda, but because they actually believe in the mission of the company. Yeah. And so, I think Meta just released something similar to that. So I, I think it's becoming like mm-hmm. pretty n- normalized. Right. Exactly. So now Elon's showing what you can do. Uh, first of all, he's showing that you can run these companies with way fewer yes. employees. I mean, I think I think he's now eliminated like two thirds or three quarters of the employees at Twitter. Site hasn't gone down yet. Um, so, and by the way, this is one of the things I think that's deeply threatening to the laptop class is, um, is that Elon is showing that you can run these companies without having so many of these, these workers. And I think they're deeply insecure about their economic value Yeah, and he's, he's demanding that they prove their economic value. And so the, this era of, um, you know, these bloated tech companies being a jobs program for surplus elites that may be coming to an end. You know, we saw the Apple thing come up a couple of weeks uh, weeks ago. There's going to be pressures from you know employees at Apple or, or Google, et cetera, for, to censor. Like, do you think that in the next two years it's possible there will be a little bit of a tech civil war, and and Elon may, you know, as his threat implied, like try to go build a phone or something? Well, Apple backed off that really quickly. Yeah. Um, I think they got brushed back from the plate. Um, Tim Cook said that there was no, he 
Tim Cook said that he was never contemplating kicking uh, Twitter out of the app store. That doesn't mean that there wasn't some some apparatchik lower down in the app store who was noodling over a, an enforcement action. And in fact, there was, I think there was somebody, remember there was somebody, uh, I think the person running the app store actually deleted their Twitter account or something. It seemed like a, a protest. So look, I think, you know, lower down in these organizations as the Twitter files show, there's always sort of more activist employees who are constantly looking for the next person or group or app to censor, you know, that, that this is, this is what they live for. Um, so I, you know, I, do I believe Tim Cook was in on it? No, but do I believe that there were conversations happening? Yeah, I do. And I think that by exposing that, I mean, I think they got brushed back from the plate and you saw it was very helpful that, you know, right away, like politicians like DeSantis were at a press conference saying that if Apple does this, it would be uh, a blatant violation of their monopoly power and should be looked at. And um, so I think these companies have to think a couple of moves ahead now, because if there's a chance that in 2024, you could have a president DeSantis or somebody like that, they have to start thinking about, well, wait, what it, what's the next administration going to do? I can't just think yeah. about what the current administration wants. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a helpful check on, um, on monopoly abuse that you have politicians telegraphing that that would not be acceptable. Yeah. The, um, I mean, you mentioned you know, Elon is proving that, you know, as a CEO, you don't have to get bullied, but internally by, by a certain, mm-hmm. you know, small number of, of activist employees, you don't have to get bullied externally. You can, you know, uh, Facebook or Uber, or other companies, which are I admire great companies, but they kind of like either apologized or conceded the moral high ground. Whereas Elon always takes the, the moral high ground. Um, so you can fight back externally. Um, but then also, I mean, he's, you know, there was this like, like he's really taken sides. I, I'm not, not in sort of like partisan sides, but he's like, when he, he calls balls and strikes as, as he, as he sees it. And, you know, some people are saying, Hey, is that the most strategic move for him to be doing? Um, like, should he be a bit more reserved? Um, so I'm curious at a high level, like one, how you even describe the Elon character arc of like, has he always been a regime defier? Because in the last few months, it seemed to escalate significantly, right? Like he, he mentioned the the Michael Brown thing, like that happened six years ago. You know, he's, he's mentioned mm-hmm. things that have happened over the past you know, few years, but he's mentioning them all within the last like few weeks. Um, so I'm curious, like what's escalated in, in, in that character arc, but then also like, are there times where you look at a, at a tweet or something and say, oh, is this the most strategic thing, you know, you could be doing right now for, for your stated goals? Well, I think you could quibble with this or that tweet, but I think the overall point of it is that Elon's going over the heads of the elite and he's appealing directly to the people. Yeah. And that's basically what you what you have to do, I think, to to win this battle. Like we said, there's the professional class is only a third of the country, the working class is two thirds. They don't have the numbers, but they have all the institutional power. And a big part of that power is their control over the media and their ability to shape narratives and you know if you're paying attention at all you realize just how biased the media has become and how activist it's become and they get caught in one lie and then they're on to the next one without even you know pausing to take a breath um the only way to fight that is to go over the heads of this elite and appeal directly to the people and um and this is why they're so exercised over the fact that elon is opening up twitter and making it a true alternative to elite media, like social media was supposed to be. And you go back yeah. 15 years, the great hope was that, again, that social media would be democratizing and provide an alternative so the average person would have a voice and be able to compete with the elite media. And instead, what happened is that the uh, content moderation m- machinery got hijacked by elites who share the same opinions as you know, as, as the elite media and they allowed, and they basically turned um, social networks like Twitter into an enforcement arm of traditional media. Yeah. And, um, and then that's the thing that's being overturned right now. And so this is why the elites are basically, um, you know, having a, a meltdown and, uh, but the only, but, you know, I think that what Elon's doing is showing a path to, to fighting back. So again, you can quibble with this or that tweet, but He's showing that he's not going to, you know, put up with it. it and then it, just it, it just look at all the insane things that the media has said in the last month. I mean, first, 
they said that, um, you know, they accused him of being a Thanos like supervillain for snapping 50% of the employees out of existence. Yeah. Then they said that he was starving the employees because he was going to charge for lunch because no <laughs> one was eating the food in the cafeteria. <laughs> and then he, they, they predicted the imminent collapse of the, of the, yeah, the company and the site would go down uh, because he gave a, a generous voluntary severance package. He said that if you don't want to be here, if you don't want to return to the office and work hard, you can take a three month severance. And so all these like liberal elites were tearfully saying their goodbyes on Twitter, predicting the site was going to go down and say, I'll, I'll see you. I'll see you in the next life on whatever on uh, Mastodon, Megalod- or- Mastodon or Megalodon or whatever. Um, I mean, it was like this, you know, the usual theatrical histrionics. Um, so it's been like one. And of course, this is that was the week before Thanksgiving. And now, you know, we're now a month later and the site's running just fine. So. He's proving that these people just aren't necessary for the running of, of a site, which again is striking fear into their hearts because you know the 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 previous for these elites was that if you simply hold the right opinions, you associate with the right causes and the right people, then your continued advancement uh, right. would occur. I mean, SBF himself explained this well. You just you hold the right. You know, this is the dumb game yeah. that we woke Westerners play. Yes. You uh, basically uh, you basically espouse the right shibboleths and so everyone likes you. And they thought that was the game. That, and that was the game. But what Elon is saying is the game has changed. Now you actually have to do something that creates economic value. And if you don't, I'm going to fire you. Yeah. And so it's like so deeply threatening to this um, elite laptop class in, in so many ways. It's ideological threatening, but but it's also threatening to their... Um, to their uh, economic interests. Yeah. Well, to, to that end, I mean, it's, it seems like, is, is it fair to say that polarization is, is probably only going to get worse or it's, or it's not going to get better. And so like, is, do you think, you know, a few years out, we will just see kind of this like almost parallel economy and that there'll be like, you know, blue products and red products, you know, blue platforms, red platforms, you know, there'll be some common things of course, but like, do you think that that's the future? Well, again, I think the the division is caused by the fact that the majority of the country holds um, more populist working class views, whereas the elite, the people yes. running the institutions, hold these far left uh, cultural views, and that's just the fundamental tension. And the question is, who wins that battle? I think that in a democracy, ultimately, the numbers will carry the day. Um, but the the the, the left wing elite is going to be kicking and screaming the whole way. And there'll be, and and this is the problem: is that the the media becomes more hysterical and um, more biased and more activist uh, as the their grip on power is is loosened. Um, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a rough ride, I think. Um, yeah. But um, now it would help a lot if the Republican Party could get their act together and give the people a a a choice that they want, because you can't get. You can't get democratic progress in our society without having one of the parties embrace your your agenda and actually, um, you know, present an alternative. And you saw that in these midterms, despite the fact that everything should have gone the Republicans' way, they didn't do very well. Yeah. And I think it's just because they didn't do a very good job presenting an alternative. And maybe, maybe and, there'll be an Elonification of the Republican Party at some point, where there's just like a really credible tech operator or or just operator. Um, who who tech can respect as as a peer? Um, well, I don't know if you're ever going to get tech to to be on board because if you look at like the political contributions and the party affiliations of the workers at places like Twitter and so on. It's like ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent, literally favors Democrats. But I think you do need a focused, disciplined operator to be the candidate of the Republican Party um, because if you give the media anything to work with, they'll you know, they'll, they'll really go to town with it. And I mean, this is frankly the problem with Trump is he just gives his political enemies so much to work with. And um, anyway, I've been on the DeSantis train yeah. uh, for a while on the pod. I think that's the type of disciplined focus type candidate that the Republican Party needs to align behind. Um, and then they need to take on more of these working class issues and causes and get, and again, complete their transformation into more of a working class party. Yeah. So let's go back to kind of recapturing the institutions, because it, it seems like there's a, a bit of a counter elite forming both at the top and at the bottom. I mean, um, you know, Noah Smith recently tweeted that 
you know, tech isn't as progressive as it used to be. And it, it, maybe it seems like over the last, before then, the last 20 years, it was, you know, up into the right with, but like something around COVID, you know, something around maybe the bills come due and there's more, more political diversity. Maybe let's just take that as, as, as given, like, what is the, what should the counter elite do? Like what, you know, um, like I'm surprised that I haven't seen like a really credible, like university competitor, um, come out that that's like more moderate, you know, the Teal fellowship obviously is a, is a great kind of innovation, but it, it's not really like a replacement because it's small scale to like a Stanford or a, um, you know, Harvard, and maybe those institutions are hard to recapture. But if, if you mentioned how the at universities have just continued to indoctrinate like our most talented kids, why hasn't that been like a place of emphasis for, for the counter elite people like yourself, like, um, like Elon, et cetera. Well, so Joe Lonsdale has actually done something, right? Yep. He's creating the University of Austin, and that's yep. um, a credible effort to create a, a major new university uh, that can compete. Um, I think there's this bigger question of like, do universities still make sense? You know, um, it's a lot of money; it's very expensive, and you get all these graduates. Um, they 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 graduate from these institutions with mountains of debt that many of them can never repay. It's not even dischargeable in bankruptcy. That makes no sense. So no wonder they're not really enthusiastic about capitalism when they can never have a reasonable shot of accumulating capital. Um, so I, I, you know, I think maybe that whole model is broken and needs to be rethought. Um, yeah. The, um, but in any event, I think you know what, what should tech leaders do? I think that this upcoming recession that we're in provides an opportunity for them to do maybe some version of what Elon is doing, which is. All of these companies are now realizing that they're bloated. They have they hired way too many people. They need to become more efficient. They need to do headcount reductions. I think I, I don't think it's ideological. I think it's just basically saying, listen, we need to really think about like who at this company is creating economic value for us. And it's not a political litmus test at all. It's just like let's let's have people go back to the office. Yeah. I think this like work from home thing was um it was ridiculously unproductive. Um, I mean, maybe not the whole company is in one headquarters location anymore, but I think you at least try to um, congregate around hubs. Yeah. So I think you you got you get get people going back to the office at least four days a week. You do a top to bottom look at again who in your organization is really providing value, and the whole idea of having you know activist employees who are basically trying to turn the the company into a who are trying to further their political agenda at the company. I mean, that is extremely unproductive. And I think CEOs are. Yeah, it's over. Yeah, that's over. And I think like this whole idea of it, this like super entitled mentality where it's almost like the, the company exists to serve the employees. I think that whole attitude is going to come to an end over the next yeah. year. It was a 0% interest, uh, you know, interest rate economy perhaps, but the, um, mm-hmm. Let, hypothetical thought experiment, like, let's say that, you know, even at a higher level, like, but, but, I, but I, I do think just finish that thought. I, I do think that if, if CEOs just like get focused, um, there will be less of this political activism coming out of these companies for the simple reason that like, imagine writing a petition, signing a petition as the employees of Apple were constantly doing last year. Remember when they were instructed to go back to the yeah. office, they started to the petition drive. It's like, who do you think you are? I mean, the company is going through a major headcount reduction and you're saying you don't want to work. You don't want to go back to the office. And instead, you want the company to take stances on a bunch of unrelated issues. And that just feels to me like, again, something that should be in the past and I think probably yeah, will be. Totally. Um, to take it a little bit further, let's say there was magically this like $20 billion pool or, or you know, maybe it's 50, I don't, some amount of like a lot of money, um, but that is like somewhat imaginable. Um, and it was meant to cause like institutional change based on the direction of like diversifying the institutions such that they represent the people. Let's just say something like that. Like, where do you think would be like the biggest bang for the buck? Is it like taking over or, you know, taking over like private equity, uh, like what Elon is doing? Do you think it's like, you know, um, trying to do that in politics, um, in, in the same way that the, the left seems to effectively do it? Like, is it, you know, media, it's kind of happening on its own perhaps, but like, what, what do you think are basically like the best bang for your buck levers of change? I think that the the program should be focused on accountability because um, what, what's basically happened is that we have this professional managerial class who are the mid-level managers. They're the the hired, you know, the hired guns 
who run these companies or run divisions of these companies or, or run these institutions. And I think what's, and then and what's basically happened is that there's a principal agent problem, right? The principals are the shareholders of these companies or the principals are the voters and the agents are the people who work for them. It's these, this sort of this managerial elite and the, the managerial elite has tried to insulate themselves from accountability. They basically don't want to be um, held accountable or fireable for their mistakes. And so, for example, on COVID, you know, you had this article in the Atlantic saying we need a COVID amnesty yes. program. So basically, you have all these elites, these, you know, uh, health bureaucrats who say that we're the experts, we're the only ones who are allowed to have an opinion on COVID. And by the way, big tech's going to enforce that. But yet, when they get everything so horribly wrong, there's no accountability. No one gets fired. Um, yeah. They just kind of move on to the the next thing. So, I think there needs to be a restoration of accountability, democratic accountability in the political sphere. And economic accountability in the you know in the business, and um, I think if we do that, I, I don't think you're going to solve this with some sort of like class war. Um, you know, it's it, you know, a, a mature capitalist economy does need a managerial class. There's no way around that. It's not like we're going to get rid of the managerial class. What needs to happen though is that. The management, the managerial class's ability to kind of usurp power, yeah, away from the real underlying uh, constituents, whether it's the shareholders or the, or the people, that needs to be, be reined in, right. And so that that's the larger program that we need is is a program of accountability, both politically and um, and, and economically. Yeah, and is that accountability come in the form of lawsuits or like or re- regulatory pressure or like where would that money? How does that money help accountability? I think it's going to have to be through some combination of, I mean, it's going to have to be, there's going to be a big legislative component to this. So, I mean, none of this goes anywhere unless the Republicans get to get their act together, become a working class party and harness the numbers that they have in the country or should have to implement this agenda. So I think it has to, I think you do need that change. And then I think economically, um, you know, we need more people in the business sphere doing some portion of what Elon is doing, which is willing to stick their necks out to do the right thing. And, um, uh, and you know, if we could just get a few more people to do that kind of stuff, it could make a big difference. Well, I, I do wonder if there's a chance that it happens in, in the Democratic Party as well, in the sense of, um, you know, the far left stuff doesn't pull well, doesn't do well. You know, there's Roy Teixeira, you, you put, turn me mm-hmm. on to, and and all these old school lefty like uh, you know Greenwald or TB. Like, I'm sure they'd be thrilled if there was if there was like a working class Democrat, you know, leader who was able to do the things that you just talked about doing on the on the Republican Party, but but in the Democrats. The the Democratic Party has always had this tension between what they called the the wine track and the beer track. Yeah, and um, <laughs> historically, it was the the beer track candidate who generally got the nomination. With the, yeah. with the, I think the one exception was was Obama is more of a wine track candidate. Biden, Biden's interesting because he sort of gives the, um, he comes across as a beer track candidate, but yeah. he's kind of a, more of a vessel for the again the professional class. And um, I just think that that the the party can't help but continue to go in that direction of that elitist, effete, professional yeah. class sensibility. Again, it's just who runs the party now and. Um, and all of the activist groups within the party. So I don't think they can help be anything other than, you know, who they are and what they believe. And um, I think the bigger question is just kind of, can the Republican party marshal this populist energy um, basically, you know, w- with a candidate who doesn't, you know, unnecessarily alienate a large portion of the electorate um, as, you know, it's kind of, populism without Trump. Uh, yeah. Cause I just think that Trump can't, I don't think he can get enough votes to, to effectuate this agenda. And even if he could, I mean, we'd just spend the next four years, um, <laughs> you know, reacting to him, you know, tweeting outrages, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you, he, he would you, empower you, the left. Yeah. It would just be this, like, it, it, I don't think we get anything done, you right. know? Um, yeah. So you need somebody who can build uh, a majority coalition and then actually execute after, you know, again, on this program of accountability for the elites. Um, 
because a society is always going to have these middle level managers. It's always going to have these elites. It's always going to have institutions. We're not going to like get rid of them all. That's just, that's not going to happen. Um, but I think that if they want the power and prerogatives that their elite status brings, they have to be accountable for the results. Yeah. Thanks so much, David, for, for coming on the podcast. It's been a great episode. Yeah. Good, good to be here. Thank you. Eric. Okay. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at ericaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together.